Thank you. We're excited to have the opportunity to welcome many people that have just recently joined our group today uh, to this great group that we've been working with the past two and a half days uh, that are really, I think all of you are going to be very pleased at the dedication and the work that's been put in and the progress we're going to see in our counties. But to kick us off this afternoon, we would like to welcome back the First Lady, Kathy Justice. She, uh, of course, was with us yesterday. And as those of you that were with us yesterday know, she is, as our hashtag says, with communities in schools, all in for kids. And we're so thankful for her leadership. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, it's great for me to be back today and uh, introduce to you well, two great speakers. The first one uh, is he's just been behind us all the way with communities and schools. Dr. Payne knew about this when we brought it to him and asked him would he be on board with us and what to do. And he's just been a trooper. I mean, he was familiar with it. He's endorsed us in every way. He's excited about it. He knows how to handle this, and we're just so thankful that he is where he is and in the position to help us do all this stuff. Uh, and we just want to say he just got back from a conference, and he has been the longest-serving state superintendent. Is that right? In the country, yes. Yeah. So let's give him a hand. I want Dr. Payne to know just how proud we are of him and how much we appreciate all he does because he certainly does have every student's best being at heart and tries to make everything happen and just in a positive, forward-thinking way. So with no further ado, here's Dr. Stephen Payne, our state superintendent. Thank you very much. I don't know if that's good. Longest state uh, serving state superintendent, Steve Roberts. I don't know if that's good or not. What do you I'm think? Longest serving chamber executive. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not sure what that means. All right. uh, I, I thank you all very much. And uh, I've been getting updates the past couple of days from Chicago. And I understand county educators, citizens, community members, uh, those working with communities and schools programs that you guys have absolutely inspired our staff because of your commitment and your expertise to this program. So let's give them a nice round of applause. If they can. <laughs> I, I also have to say this. So I, I, I uh, Phil was uh, up at a golf tournament at the Green Bar years ago. That's back when I was skinny and had hair. That's why I didn't recognize that. <laughs> and it was a fundraiser for the Communities and Schools program in Greenbrier County. Um, I knew that you had something special then, and then when the First Lady uh, came to her position and she talked about communities and schools, it was an absolute no-brainer for me. So uh, I, I have to tell you that the pro any program, and you've probably heard this, but in Greenbrier County, I don't know what the statistics are today, but formally, uh, this is as current as I get. Any program that has a 100% graduation rate from the program from high school, I know of no other program in the country that can boast of those results. And so, First Lady Justice, when you suggested that we take a look at the program, as I said, it was a no-brainer. Those kinds of results can be replicated anywhere with caring adults that take care of the kids that they care about within their communities, in their schools. And so that's why we're here. So we went to uh, three other districts last year, Wyoming County. Uh, who's, where's Wyoming County? <laughs> well, stand up. I want, to, I want everybody to see you. <laughs> there you go. You have done a fantastic job in Wyoming County, and we deeply appreciate your commitment and the enthusiasm that you bring to the table. How about McDowell County? Where are y'all? Stand up. Stand up and likewise, the tremendous commitment you've brought to the table as well. How about Berkeley County? Where are you? 
those three counties joined us in, in the first year, and now we've expanded to how many counties, Michelle? I forget. Eight more, nine more. Well, Eight nine more, nine more. <laughs> Point flip. <laughs> Eight to nine more. Eight nine. More counties, and for all of you to commit to this program, I think you are in for a wonderful, wonderful ride because with it's programs like these that you'll see results. Before I talk just a brief minute about social, emotional, mental health learning and some reflections from the meeting I just came from, where that was at the front and center in every single state in the country, we're not alone. I'd like to introduce some folks that are here today. First of all, members of the legislature, Delegate Worrell, Worrell, did I say that correctly? Pronounce it, Worrell, and Delegate Linville, and State Senator Bob Plymouth. Please stand. Thank you for coming. Uh, State Board President Dave Perry and Vice President Miller Hall. And, yep, I'm sorry, Member Deborah Sullivan, too. Uh, a good friend and colleague of mine, President Jerry Gilbert from Marshall University. Thanks for coming, sir. With all the advisory council members of the First Ladies Communities and Schools Advisory Council, would you all please stand and be recognized? And we have others, friends, Steve Roberts from the Chamber. Steve's here. Uh, who else? Am I missing somebody? I hate doing this because I always <laughs> tend to tend to leave somebody out. So if I if I do, I just as I said, I just came from a conference where uh, I met with other state superintendents throughout the country, and to listen to them and how they address their challenges, they have very similar challenges to us. To hear California talk about all of the opioid addictions and problems and all foster care children and all of the issues that they deal with and then compare us to them, hmm, uh, they have their work cut out for them, as we do here in West Virginia. But the one thing that we all shared in common, and Pedro Naguero from UCLA spoke to us, and if you've ever heard him speak, I think he's probably been at a few communities and schools meetings, he brought me back to the days, Jerry, of the effective schools. And we believe that all kids can learn. And we also believed in the teaching for learning for all mission, that equity needs to exist in quality. We can have quality school performance with equitable distributions of children across the spectrum. And as the late, great Ron Edmonds said, we can, whenever and wherever we choose, educate all children whose schooling is of interest to us. We already know more than we need in order to do this. Whether we do it or not must finally depend on the fact that we haven't done it so far. So the excuses are out of the way. And so today, the issues are opioid addictions, kids coming from those families. There are foster care situations. We have 30% of our children in foster care are under the age of five years of age. We have 52%, Carla Warren tells me, of children that are that have had one traumatic life experience which places them in a category of kids that are affected by trauma. And so more than ever, we need programs like communities and schools. But what we really need to do, and we need you to be our lighthouses, we need you to accept no excuses to not educate these kids because we already know from research, the social, emotional, mental health learning, we already know more than we need in order to get this job done. We have extra work to do. You need to take, we need collectively, collaboratively, to take care of the needs, the social, emotional, mental health needs of every child. Before they can learn algebraic expressions, robotics, split infinitives, whatever it might be. We have to do that first. And so it's a little bit more complex task. We're so grateful to the governor and the legislature this year for your appropriation of monies in, 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 the, in the bill, uh, the omnibus bill, there's some $30 million to send directly to counties to address these social, emotional, mental health needs. And we really hope that you will be good stewards of that money as you address those needs with your most at-risk kids. For when we do that, we roll up our sleeves, we accept no excuses, we accept the responsibility to educate every single one of these kids, then we will be very, very successful. I have the great pleasure, I don't feel like I need to read this bio. No. <laughs> <laughs> Man, 
Maybe a little bit. Just a little Maybe just a little bit. I had the pleasure, he may not, re, like I said, remember when we met, but years ago in Greenbrier County, I think he was driving a golf cart around, if I'm not mistaken. Bill Milliken is the founder and the vice chairman of Communities and Schools. He's one of the nation's foremost pioneers in this movement and has had at-risk kids, kids in need, whatever we want to call them, at the heart and at the very fiber of his being for years and years and years. He started in 1960 with a group called Young Life, uh, and then from there he went on uh, with another with a heart and, uh, for, for these children. He uh, developed a model program in existing resources. He took existing resources, put them into community schools, and thus the name Communities in Schools and the network thereafter was, was founded. Bill uh, led the group as president until May 2004. He uh, currently resides in Northern Virginia and still very, very deeply engaged in the work of communities and schools. I could go on and on and tell you how he transcended three tenures of presidents, how they sought him out for his advice with at-risk children throughout the country. I, I, I mean, your bio is like unbelievable. And uh, for all the work that you've done, sir, with all of the nation's at-risk children, you think about the millions of students that you're serving right now, million and a half, I believe, or more. All of the, all the different states, all of the meaningful work, all the lives that have been touched as a result of your leadership. We thank you, and I introduce to you today, Bill Milton. I am gifted because my wife's retired now. We get to do these things together, and you were right. I shouldn't wear light pants. I spilled something on them again. But that's right. we, we celebrated our 55th anniversary this year, and she said, actually, she said it was actually 106, the 53 I remember, and the 53 she remembers. So some of you may be able to relate to that. But what a gift to be here. I, I, I was so emotional this morning, I was ready to, to go out and just go for a long walk. I, I just overwhelmed with the hope that I, I have today. And hope that I didn't come here with, actually. I mean, it's so easy to be caught up in all the negativity and all the gloom out there, and then you walk into a room of compassionate and caring people that really care about the future of their children and their grandchildren to put all that other things aside so that we can be out there for loving kids who the change. And so it's such a gift. And I thank you for your caring because it gives us hope. And our whole, you're part of a huge movement out there and a lot of eyes are on here because this is a whole new way for CIS to reach so many more young people. And I thank you as First Lady. I, I, I felt like we got connected in 15 minutes. I mean, I just... You made me feel so relaxed and just so, uh, I used to be so scared of people like you and, <laughs> and superintendents and principals and God has a great sense of humor that I'm in, a, in education. I hate when they read my background and biography. I, I, I think when I'm most happy is when people realize this is the grassroots movement that became a national movement. Uh, I was asked, I was speaking to a bunch of business people, investment people, uh, on our impact of that we were returning $11.60 for every dollar that's been spent on us. They did a study, a 25-year study in Texas that was presented to the legislature. There, and I, I said, this is not only helping kids, but doing it in an efficient and caring way. But I said, you know, in that meeting with these business people, they were very uppity and very smart. And uh, I always get intimidated there. And they said, well, how did you get involved in education? I said, well, actually, the day I got kicked out of high school. And it, it just got silent. They didn't know what to say. They, 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 didn't, they only read the, the stuff that was on the paper. But I'm alive today because somebody in Pittsburgh, when I was kicked out, came into my neighborhood, a group called Young Life, and loved me into change. And 
Another question that was asked by these business people, if you, it was not a business person, it was a reporter, said, well, if you, when you pass away, what would you want on your tombstone? And I said, the one thing that I've said, <laughs> that for some reason was taken off, and even ended up on a Starbucks cup, my grandchildren were so impressed. <laughs> but it's relationships that change people, not programs. That love's the only transformational thing we have. It's not brain surgery. That what we're talking about is justice isn't just us, it's all of us. That all these children are our children, not just the ones we give birth to, not just, it, it's really that simple. And somebody came in and got me, and by the way, my first time in West Virginia was after I got kicked out of school, I found out where Wheeling was. And we could do a lot more in Wheeling than we could do in Pittsburgh, so that it was kind of a negative start to that journey in West Virginia. This is much better. But I, only five of my friends made it to third without being dead or in jail. And I saw the power of somebody coming and walking through the valley of the shadow of adolescence. Some, there's nothing more powerful than somebody believing in you. And all people believed was, there was, there was negative things about you. Hope comes when somebody believes in you. And it was a closet, and I was asked to give a quick arc of the history of what you're part of. This didn't just start 40 years ago. This year will be my 60th year since I moved into Harlem at 20 years old. After I got helped out, one of my friends had survived, and he happened to be on heroin at the time. And he owed a little time, so he went there, and I went. Uh, my mentor got me back in school, and I eventually finished three freshman years of college, which totally qualifies me to be an educator. <laughs> but they, they didn't know about learning differences back then. And I've lived with the pain of feeling dumb my whole life, no matter how many important people I knew. Because I was put in a special thing, and actually my mom was brought into school and said it would be better, he can't handle the work. So he'd be better off outside. And that put the dagger in. Because I could read something in front of the class and then I'd get embarrassed because they'd say, what did you read? And I couldn't understand. I had no retention. And I said some bad things to the teacher and did some bad things and then excommunicated me. <laughs> but that began, people say, why are you still at this? I still, because I don't want kids. But the prisons are full of my friends that are and really, really smart, but they just learn differently. And we've come so far. The, Second time in, in West Virginia, was we, we have an adopted daughter that happened to come to us and had huge learning issues, and we struggled and got through, and somebody said there's a school in West Virginia called West Virginia, West Virginia Wesley, and I drove up over and Gina and I over those freaking mountains. And, <laughs> but there were some people there that understood people like me. Our prisons are full of people like me. And I got to speak to all the attorney generals a few years back, which is another one of my guys that I hung out with in Pittsburgh said, are they all going to arrest you at once? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I've changed a lot since then. But at the end, it was because of our data. They had not seen these kind of income uh, outcomes that our superintendent just mentioned there. And I went through. They are a warm, fuzzy group. So I got through my presentation and actually had a few minutes left. And they, they, said, they said, do you have anything else to say? I said, yeah, I won't be back here. I feel such a gift that you let a nonprofit in here. I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd be here. I, I want to tell you something that you all know. I don't care how tough you are, how not tough. You know in your guts that if a kid doesn't have hope, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to hurt you or they're going to hurt themselves. And they stood up. They said they never do this in a plot. Vinny had no hope, so he put a needle in himself. I didn't have hope, and I got part of a group that hurt other people. When you give us hope, though, we turned around, and Vinny served till he died on the streets. He kept his commitment. And so the two of us, before he passed away, he was with 10 years at least, we moved into Harlem and began to just love kids, going where they are. Love doesn't just talk about it. It's in your face. We need less Facebook and more in your face of eyeball to eyeball, life on life. That information ship's not your friend, it's the relationship that's your friend. 
And we need to give kids the hunger I see out in the country. Two main things that we've been talking about, but people are hungry for somebody to give a damn to exist. And these kids want a caring community of people who care. So in the few minutes here, I want to just say, for your journey, because you already know the details, you read all the stuff, and I haven't even read the CIS stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I hear it's good. <laughs> It's really built, I was thinking about it when I was walking around, here. it's really built on the foundation of three things. I hope this, I hope I remember it. <laughs> but the first and foremost is what I just talked about. It's all about a caring adult. And the ones that make it, they made it because we allowed them to make it. By giving them a choice and saying, we're with you, you have to do it. But we're gonna walk with you through the valley of the shadow of adolescence and love you in the change. There's nothing else. I said, I've had a chance to be in Congress and White Houses, streets of Harlem. If you won't let me talk about love, then you forget about it, because that's the only transformational thing we have. So it starts with relationship, and that's what it's built on. But the second thing is the community part of it. Now, for some reason, uh, after the 60s, we, what got me into education was we were doing these little clubs for kids at the church and taking them to camp and all that stuff. And Vinny one day said, hey, all these kids are living on rooftops. How can we say we love them and let them live on rooftops? I said, I don't know. And so this minister in Harlem knew the head priest of the wealthiest church on Wall Street, Trinity Parish. So we went and met with him and I get, talked him into giving me two tenement apartments, one for young ladies and for young, young men. So the first basic I learned was it was relationships that changed people. Over the next five years, I had 50, 30 to 35 young people living with me at a time. And I learned what it meant to build real community. My community was negative, so I had to learn the hard way. And I was so full of pain when I heard that stuff this morning, because it still comes back up at a time. Gina and I got married. I'd spoken at 12 funerals for kids that I saw dead on my apartment with a needle in their arm or shot. And I said, what kind of country is this that 40 blocks away are the wealthiest people in the world? And I'm burying kids. And I'm in my 20s, so I got angry. I got my voice. I don't know how to write a speech, but I got it in here. And I said, this got to quit. We're going to be two Americans. You could see it. It wasn't anybody planning it that way. We were coming apart and we didn't know. Well, I'm self-taught, which is dangerous. But I'm going to give you the very short version of this. And we didn't drive all the way down here for me to be short, so just relax. <laughs> I'm going to eat a big meal tonight. Anyway. And again, this is a huge training, three or four hours, just in two minutes. But I traced it back to right after World War II, and it's nobody's fault. We blame everybody for everything. No, it, did, it was change. For the first time in the history of this country, the majority, instead of going to farms, went into cities and, you know, fairly good-sized towns. You had the GI Bill kick in during the next few years. The economy heats up. And then there's a great book called Man, Child, and the Promised Land that talked about our African-American uh, brothers and sisters going from the Mississippis, the Alabamas, and coming to find hope in the uh, what was it? Man, child, the promised land, but they didn't find promise or land because they weren't ready for the economy up there. And they found out that there was racial issues in the north, just like the south. We had things begin to pull apart. My theory was, and fortunately, I think our creator gave me this, that we slowly pulled apart the safety net for children, which was the extended family in relationship with the faith community. We're building the new barn when it burned down. When things went down, like your community, coming together as a community. Uh, Hillary, Ray, you remember, wrote the book, uh, Takes a Village to Raise a Child, uh, based on the African Proverbs. I said to her, I said, we don't have the village anymore. So until you understand what happened to the village, because it slowly got pulled apart as we got more mobile, et cetera, we got to bring that which is fragmented and bring it back into wholeness. There's a breakdown in the community, and I warned in 1971 in a testimony, first time I ever was asked to testify in Washington. <laughs> That's a trip. Uh, <laughs> then I said, 
they asked me, well, the reason, let me ask to tell you why. I mean, I don't have enough time to go into it all, but I was asked to testify because they were looking for a white guy with long hair who had been in a riot. And so they were studying the riots. And so they asked what I thought was going to be the next big issue. And I said, we're going to win or lose the future of America at the schoolhouse door. But you're going to think it's an education issue. I say it's a breakdown of the community issue. And I said, the kids who were living with me from the streets, they weren't dropping out of school because of education. It's because nobody knew their name. They felt worth less. They maybe have been raped or molested or something, and they're coming in and we're asking our teachers to teach. I said, this is a disaster. The teachers are going to be asked to be mother, father, sister, brother, social worker, hall guard. And I warned that we're going to blame the teachers in the schools. I say, it was unnatural that schools fell into the vacuum that was created by this breakdown of the safety net that we warned back then. Now, I didn't know they called them hearings because nobody's listening. And so it's taken all these years for our superintendent to come and say they're talking about, they use the big word, social-emotional. Uh, not all kids go to school equally. All kids can learn, but not all kids go to school equally. Where did I learn that? After lots of failure, I began to, to learn how to build community in this apartment. After I never lost another kid. Uh, my granddaughter got to introduce, introduce me to the University of Virginia, <laughs> and she said, I have the only grandfather that's written as many books as he's read, which is four of each. <laughs> <laughs> but the first one was tough love. It all came out of here. My wife got me into therapy because she I had PTSD and didn't know it, and was too proud about it, but I was crazy and so full of pain. But I wrote a thing called Tough Love. It just poured out of me. Then along with caring, you have to have accountability. So CIS is built on not just a caring adult, but a caring community that combines caring but accountability. And I never lost another kid. These are the foundations that this was all built on. So I, I said, we got to do something about education because some of these kids are starting to make it. And how can we say we love them? and tell them, all oh, you're straight, you're off drugs, now go get a job, and they can't get a job because they don't have an education, they gotta sell drugs. This is simple stuff, folks. This isn't, this isn't about Republicans or Democrats or anything, this is about us as human beings, a lot of you, our neighbors as ourselves. So, I wasn't real popular with school people <laughs> back then because of the talks I was giving, because I didn't understand what was going on. So I wasn't allowed in the schools, which really ticked me off. They threw me out and then they wouldn't let me back in. And they didn't want our kids. So this really started outside the schools. And after learning about the caring adult and the safe community, we we're moving into how do we give these kids a skill, a remarkable skill, because we can't say we care about them. So, Vinnie had an eighth grade education. I had three freshman years of college. So we were perfect to take on education. <laughs> so I found out that rich people called their schools academies. I also found out what a GED was. I didn't know what that was, but back then it was gold. So here were all these smart people, the Bill Bradleys, people from the Princetons, the Columbias, the New York. They were all marching on this and that. So then came the concept. I knew how to turn kids on the living. You all know how to teach. So I'll turn them on the living, and you turn them on the learning. And, we'll do, and I, as I said, I found out rich people called their schools academies. I made the mistake of called liberation school. Don't do that. It's hard for fundraising. <laughs> so I found out what rich people called their schools, and they said academy. I said, hell, true, written by the Ford Foundation. Never been in a foundation in my life. We have this thing called a street academy. Eight weeks later, I'm being in my first boardroom and they're offering me money for this miracle in Harlem. I said, man, all you do is change the name and they give you money. <laughs> yeah, hell of a country. <laughs> <laughs> but then in God's province, uh, we were at the right place at the right time. <laughs> a painful place, but the riots were down. And we had this island of hope in the midst of it. Don't worry about all the noise up here. You've got to have hope. You've got to point toward hope. Something that 
So all of a sudden, Wall Street, which at the time I felt so inferior and felt so uptight about it, our minister at the church in Harlem said they'd rather talk to a crazy white guy than me. So I became the liaison, my friends and I. And I went down there and said, we want to give you money to, to take these schools and build more schools for these kids. I said, I don't want just your money, I want you. This isn't my problem. You have one gift, I have another gift, but this is our problem. I'm not a charity. I have passion because I don't want to see kids end up like my friends ended up, and I almost ended up. So I got them to put the name Morgan Guarantee Street Academy out. I just totally sold out. So, and within 18 months, we had eight schools in Harlem. We had an IBM school, AT&T, American Airlines, Union Carbide. We were building a bridge from their street to our street. And there was hope right in the midst of the riots, right in the middle. I found out that you go from prep, well, you got prep schools after, you know, some of our students, we started the first high school in Harlem. Charlie Wrangle, the congressman. There was no high school. We took over an old Burnout A&M, and &M, a &M, what, whatever, the grocery store, like, A&P, A&P. And we had Harlem Prep School. So we were learning, we were learning. And too long a story for today, but we convinced the post office to have postal street academies. We trained postmen to be community organizers. And we, every time there was a riot, we spread these out there. It was because of that that I was asked to testify in Washington. Because they'd seen hardcore naked. A lot didn't make it. But once, none of them were supposed to. So I just went to Arlington Cemetery this past week. First time, what an incredible place. And a guy named Dick Luger was buried. I was asked by his family to be there. But Dick Luger and I had about as much in common as Abbott and Costello. I, I don't know, that, that just came to my head. Maybe they had a lot in common. But I got introduced one time with him. He was the senator from Indiana that just passed away this past year, one of our great leaders. And I was introduced, he was a road scholar, and I was a road scholar. <laughs> and the thing had come to Harlem in the 60s. In fact, they, they had to go to special host, but they wouldn't come in our neighborhood. He saw one of these schools, and I started one in Indianapolis. He was the mayor representing the mayors on this commission studying the riots. And he came up to me and said, could you do a heart transplant? What you're doing isn't sustainable. Could you do a heart transplant, take what was working outside the schools, and put it in the schools? We wouldn't be here without Dick Luger. And I later got to introduce him to Jimmy Carter, this guy from the streets, and they were best friends their whole life, even they disagreed on policy, but they were friends. That's what we were to be about. I'm not gonna go down that tunnel, but let me just tell you that we need each other more than ever. So he took me to a foundation that had never given before and never given since money for something that yet had not even started. And they stuck with all our failures for the four or five years, and you're here today because of it. And we started out with 120 kids in one school, and now we have a million six hundred thousand kids. So you're part of this incredible history, this movement. And the reason I'm so excited, I never thought in my life I'd see the first lady take up. And, and people all together say, we're going to take on the whole freaking state. I'm going to get to know it better. <laughs> the drive down was beautiful. So the foundation is always, it's the relationship. The other is a strong, caring community. And can I take a few more minutes? Because I want to give one quick illustration. Okay. When do we have the collection Oh, that's a good, that's a good I'll tell you where this came up. I, I had a wild businessman that became one of my big funders and friends, and he called me and a few friends together. He said, I've got this idea, and I want you to organize the grassroots part of it, because you're the only one I know who could do that part of it. But he got the idea, some of you may be old enough that you were there, but decided to have a summit. It was the last year of the Clinton administration to have a summit where we'd have all the living presidents and Mrs. Reagan and Charlie, or uh, uh, Governor, or no, he was a mayor, Randall, would host it in Philadelphia. We would bring people from the, 
from the chambers, from the governors, from grassroots, from all over the country, and raise the consciousness of the growing divide between have and have nots. By the way, as a footnote, when he took me to dinner and said, I want you to do that, I said, I don't believe in summits. People go up there and, they, they, and then they come down, nothing happens. I said, look at the first one. This gray-haired guy with a beard goes up on his frickin' mouth, writes down ten things, comes down and has to smash them. They said, they don't work. He said, I give you a lot of money. You're going to work. <laughs> so we did organize it. And I was behind the scenes working, and then the, I thought, you know, it was phenomenal. And it did raise some consciousness, and it was at least a beginning to show what was happening in the country. Well, I don't sleep much, and I didn't sleep much. And I, I, it was the final day coming up. I get a, a, a call at 3 in the morning. One of the people who was to speak in the final of the three can't make it. You can run the mouth. So why don't you? I said, nobody knows who I I said, just do it. We don't have anybody else. <laughs> I got up on that stage and I was so tired. I can't write speeches because of my learning thing. It has to come through me. And fortunately, because I got up there, and again, God has a great sense of humor. I had a governor and a mayor. Uh, they're, they're no in existence, so I can tell you. Anyhow, and I was the final. Well, they were so boring, I could have got up and belched and got a standing <laughs> ovation. So I was being protected. And it was probably the most embarrassing moment of my life. I got up to that thing. It, remember, I'd been given since the streets of Harlem all the way up. I'm up on this thing where presidents spoke. Here's the greatest opportunity to speak out on what's happening to so many children in the country. And I lost control of myself and just wept. Not just cry. I just wanted a plane to pick me up and take me away and just die. It was so embarrassing, my moment. And then I got called. I got their attention. Could have heard a pin drop. I said, I've been at this for all these years, talking about the youth issue and problem in America. And I stood there, I was sitting there, and all of a sudden it came to me, we don't have a youth problem in America. We have an adult problem. How can we ask our kids to care about one another if we don't care about one another, if we're always fighting each other? If they don't see us, you can't give away what you don't have. You can't give away community unless you are community. I don't know how to run a class of male-female relations or black-white relations. We need them, brown. But I have gone into schools that were so divided racially and within three years the kids are eating together because the adults are eating together. We said instead of going all over town looking for help, a kid needs a PhD in help, to find help, let's bring the help to where they are. It was a simple idea. When they see us care about each other, and we love each other, then the kids start feeling safer than they are. I was one fighting breaking up of gangs in New York and the city said, I said drugs are gonna come in here like crazy. We need to turn the gangs into families that we surround them with. And sure enough, they got rid of the gangs and we had a heroin that just wiped out our kids. Good intentions often have some pretty bad results if we don't think through, what do we want for us and our kids? So the first really block is you start with relationship. You've got a caring community of adults. And the third is a caring delivery system. I literally, we've got some language in the new ESSA bill that's out there, it took seven years get this social emotional idea in. And I had a senator who became a good friend. He said, Bill, if you could just make this more difficult, I could get you a hell of a lot more money. <laughs> I realized my wife was the site coordinator you're talking about. We had money. The kid needed a dentist, a doctor, and it, it, she was the router. She was the person inside the system. So I was so inferior to business people until I found out they gave away money opposite how they made it. Then they criticized government. All government wastes money. I said, you waste money too. You make your money in an integrated way, then you give it away to boys and girls clubs over here, to health people over here, to faith people. Kid needs a PhD in system, then you waste money because you never would spend your money where you sold your hats in one part of town, your shoes in another, your socks in another. You'd be bankrupt. 
So you got to think differently. You got to give away your money in an integrated way. And the best illustration, when you hear about our site coordinators, you, you're the army on the ground. You're the boots on the ground, whether it's about shooting or drugs, you've got to know your Navy. I had the privilege of working with General Powell, who was our chair of our summit. And I was describing communities and schools the first time. He said, you just described my, my life in two minutes. I just wrote a book, don't tell people. <laughs> I got to sell them. <laughs> but he said, I get it. I grew up in the South Bronx. I at least had two parents, but we were poor. We didn't. But he said, we didn't have the internet. We had an aunt net. The aunts hung out on, a, on looking out the windows. The cop was on the corner. The priest was in the pizza store. If we did something eight blocks away, our old man beat. Yeah, it was bad. I went in the army to get away. <laughs> Our site coordinator is that person who knows everybody by name, knows who they are. You're on the firing line. I pray every day for our site coordinator because this is what we are bringing to the country is that person who frees the teachers up to be teachers and works in partnership with the principal, one outside, one inside, one integrating the services, building that orchestra of of resources around there in a caring way. The best thing you have, I, we were growing so fast and somebody told me we had to have a longitudinal study and I said, that's gonna cost a hell of a lot of money. That's a big order. You mean to say that it's relationships and community? Okay, spend your money. But we had to collect, collect, cause we were decentralized. Every local owns it. And uh, so I said, who knows this? And, and this was the 90s and the go-go of the technology world. I said, I don't have much time and money. Where's it? Yeah, go for Cisco system. So I don't know anything except upload, download, and reload. So I had to <laughs> at least understand something about So I spent one year working my way up to where miraculously they said, if you come out, we're giving you the biggest check you've ever gotten. You're going to have 15 minutes with Mr. Mortgage, who was the founder, and the guy who came over from IBM. And I walked, I said, just send the check. I don't need to meet him. <laughs> so another, he said, no, you gotta come. I walk into this meeting, and I'm gonna wind this down. But I learned so much. It, it, we wouldn't be here today if it hadn't gone well. These two gentlemen walked in and said, what the hell is this thing about? I said, oh, that staff gave them a really good meeting. And he said, well, this is a charity we've been talking about. What, what? We sent stuff up to you. you well, you're the charity people, and uh, why should we support this charity? And I said, I'm not a charity. <laughs> and um, what do you mean you're not a charity? Aren't you a 501c3? I said, that doesn't make me a charity. This is a business deal. And I only have 15 minutes, but I'm going to spend my little bit of time telling you, don't tell people that your technology is going to bridge the digital divide because you're going to increase it. You may get 20% off, but you're going to leave 80% back because our kids can't compute at the 8th grade level. They can't read at the ninth grade level. So you need to build your system all the way down to birth. The same way as I've told people in STEM. STEMs don't grow without roots. You've got to build it all the way down. These kids are starting with less vocabulary, less math skills by the time they get into our teachers in the schools. I said, this is a business deal because we're your future workforce. You happen to have these gifts, I have these gifts. I'm not in the dropout prevention business. I'm about loving kids' business and about my children and grandchildren's future. So we got to quit going around playing games with people and, oh, please give us money for No, no, we're in this together. It's from the first lady to the head of the company to the mother on the streets to the wonderful fire chief, all of us being one big orchestra. So they, actually it was 20 minutes into the meeting, I, 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 the people brought me there were jumping out of windows because they figured we were going to get fired. But it was this answer that got me. And I thought when I was in that session this morning, the second session, they said, well, what makes you different? And there was fortunately a little pad, they still had paper. And I drew an X. And they said, what's that? I said, that's my router. No, this is the early night. They go, we have the router. I said, yeah, you're going to change how we collect, organize, and disseminate information. I can call Atlanta, Georgia, to my best friend, who's the super router in Atlanta, 
who has built relationships with everybody from the mayor to the junior league to the mothers against drug driving to the kids on the streets to the unions. That person is getting people to a common table to work together and then we put little wilders called site coordinators in every school. You can't have an orchestra without a conductor anymore than you can have an integrated, uh, integrated system without an integrator. Boom. I said, you're high tech, we're high touch. You put those two worlds together and we can change America. They believe me. <laughs> they gave me actually more money than I asked for we would be sitting there too. Our creator was able to give the idea, and I took a huge chance, because if you stay focused on love and the kids, and not about whether people give you money or not, that people see that this is an all of our issue. And we all have different gifts to do, whether you're a legislator, or whether you're in chamber of commerce, or the first lady, or on the firing lines, or principals, or superintendent. It's all about a caring adult, a caring community, and a caring delivery system. We're talking about changing the delivery system. And I was called in that ways and means years ago when I was working on this legislation. They said, what would you like to see changed if you were sitting in my seat? I said, we'd be in deep trouble if I was in your seat. <laughs> but I said, you know what? I wish you would change the, the dialogue in Washington. You keep talking about getting rid of big government that's wasting money so that we can have a small government waste money. We've got to think about how we deliver our resources in the most caring, accountable, coordinated way. I said, I'm more conservative than anybody in this room because every dollar we waste, that's another dollar we, we don't help a kid. So we need to come together with caring and accountable systems. That's why we have data. And I'll end with this. And that big thing I was doing with these investment bankers up in New York a couple weeks ago, they, they started off, you know, I mean, it was so heavy. And they said, well, because uh, it was on impact investing. And uh, they said, well, are you data driven? And that was a softball. And they said, no. I'm relationship driven. Therefore, I want the best data out there. Because I want to see those kids get the same care that my kids got, that our grandchildren's get. We love all children as our children, then we want the best for all of them, not something second grade. And it changed the whole conversation in that room. I'm sorry I took so much time, but I just, I can't tell you how much I had hope that you're taking this on. You, if you make this work in this state, we're going to be able to go into states that we could never go in that are large rural areas because we haven't been doing a real great job in the rural part. We know how to knock it out of the park in the urban areas. But you've given us a chance. You all have. And we're part of your family and you're part of this movement throughout the country. This is just an organization, but it's a movement. I thank God for you. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Everybody on your feet. Dr. Gilbert, forgive me for one second. So, any Mountaineer fans in here? So, what do we sing at the end of the game? So, for you, Mr. Milliken, almost heaven, West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountain, Shenandoah River. Life is old there, older than the trees, younger than the mountains, blowing like a breeze. Country roads, take me home to the place I belong. West Virginia, Mountain Mama, take me home. Country roads. Take me home down country roads. So,
make sure the road always finds your way back to heaven.